Hi, and welcome. We're going to be taking a journey together here, and it's a journey that's the most important one that we ever take, and that's the journey inside our own minds. We want to remember that everything that happens out there begins in here. And when we connect what's up here in our minds to what's down here in our hearts, we actually have the power of God emanating through us. This course is about relationships and spirituality. Now, there are a lot of questions that we all have about relationships. How do I do relationships that are romantic? How do I do relationships at work? How do I do relationships with this or with that? With this particular course, we're going to be talking about the universal principles at the heart of all the great religious systems of the world and the universal principles that apply to all form of relationship. Now, you might know that I'm a student of A Course in Miracles. Perhaps you are, too. And in 1992, I published a book called A Return to Love. Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today are those principles of A Course in Miracles as they are reflected in my book, A Return to Love. A Course in Miracles is not a religion. There's no dogma, there's no doctrine, and the principles of the Course in Miracles sort of come across not with any kind of a you should, but just kind of a attitude of just thought you might like to know. And this whole just think you might like to know means that you might want to know what the laws of consciousness are as they apply to relationships. Because just as there are objective discernible laws of our external experience, there are objective discernible laws of our internal experience. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are those principles as articulated in the course for you to then apply to your relationships. I'm like your aerobics instructor. I can't do it for you, but I'm going through these moves with you and hopefully it's <laughs> developing my own internal musculature. We have external muscles and we have internal muscles. Our internal muscles are our attitudinal muscles. Think of yoga. It's much like yoga, but it's an internal yoga. You get to the right position. And if you're in the correct position, then everything flows from there. So that's what this course is about. This course is about taking ourselves to a right attitudinal position. And that's what the word righteous means, right use of the mind. So you're going to be learning some principles here that aren't difficult, but they're different. That's one of the things it says in The Course in Miracles, where he says, my way is not difficult, but it's different. So nothing that I'm talking about here in this course is difficult, but what can be extremely difficult is our resistance to doing these things. I wrote this book in 1992, and even looking at it, looking over it in the last few days, getting ready for this course, it's like shocking to me how many things I've done wrong since writing that book about principles that I know. We all know these things, but wow, the ego is so strong at making us forget what we already know. And you're going to find that a lot in this course. You're going to find, oh, I know that. I know that. We all know that. But, you know, the Course in Miracles says that principles of enlightenment begin as abstract concepts. And then they took a, take a journey without distance from the head to the heart. A lot of these principles are common sense. A lot of them are kind of different, but even though they're different, they're all different in a way, they're different from the thinking that pervades the world. Because the world is dominated by a thought system that is 180 degrees away from the thinking of God. So the thinking of the world is 180 degrees away from the thinking of God because the thinking of God or the mind of God is pure, unconditional love. And the thinking of the world is based on lovelessness or fear. Love is to fear what light is to darkness. But you and I, living on this planet, have been mentally trained to perceive without love. We have an automatic and an instinctive uh, temptation to move into judgment, to move into attack, to move into defensiveness. And so it takes <clears throat> a training of the attitudinal muscles to relinquish a thought system of fear and to accept instead a thought system based on love. So the issue is that it's not enough to just know. The issue is to practice. So there are going to be a lot of times in this course when you'll probably feel like stopping, taking some notes, writing some things down, really reflecting on particular relationships that you have, use it. That's what you should do with this course. Really use it. Really get down with it. And then, because you're applying these principles to your life, 
because you're applying them in very practical ways, that is what will make your relationships transform. Just knowing this stuff, <laughs> that of itself won't do it. And I could tell you, if just knowing it was enough, uh, I could tell you, just knowing it is not enough. It's practicing these principles that will make all the difference. So before I read A Course in Miracles, I had read and studied a lot of spiritual and religious material. Now, there's only one truth, with a capital T, and it's spoken in many different ways. A Course in Miracles doesn't have any kind of monopoly on truth. It doesn't claim anything like that, nor is it a religion. There's no doctrine. There's no dogma. But I'm going to use the language of A Course in Miracles because even though this language is no different than languages in other systems, you know, whether it's Buddhism or Judaism or Christianity or Mr. Christianity or, or uh, the Kabbalah or, or Muslim, Islam or Hinduism, you'll see these same themes repeated over and over. But I'm going to talk in terms of the principles of a particular set of books, i.e. A Course in Miracles, so that it is integrated within one thought system. You can apply it, you can translate it however is right for you. So I had read a lot of spiritual books. But there was something I didn't really get until I read the Course. Now that's not to say it wasn't written elsewhere, it's just that I hadn't really gotten it. And that has to do with the role of relationships in our journey to God. It was almost as though I felt like I was trying so hard to find the peace of God. And I likened it to a flight of stairs that was in front of a gigantic cathedral. And I walked up those stairs, and sometimes my knees were bloody, my elbows were bloody. I wanted so much to open that door. But over and over and over again, I got up the flight of stairs, and the door was locked. And I would try so hard, I couldn't unlock the door. Now, what I realized reading The Course in Miracles was that the door is the person in front of me that I couldn't unlock the door until I realized that the door was the person in front of me or the person I was thinking about. So what I learned from the Course is that there is no way to separate your journey to God, your spiritual journey, from your relationship to other people. Because God is love, and God is love extended. And the purpose of our lives is to learn to love as God loves. Now, as I already said, the thinking of the world is 180 degrees away from the thinking of God. So the thinking of God is pure extension of love, that there is love coming into our minds at every moment, and at every moment we make a choice. Sometimes we make a conscious choice, and sometimes we make an unconscious choice, but we are always making a choice. And the choice we make is the level of cause, and then for every cause, there is an effect. Cause and effect, action, reaction. Every moment, in every relationship, your heart is open or your heart is closed. The Course in Miracles says there are only two forms, two kinds of emotion. There is love and there is fear. Now that right there, think about what discipline it takes, what musculature, what attitudinal musculature it takes. Once again, not that that's so difficult, but it's very different to say in every moment, it's really very simple. Am I open in this generous space of affirmation, possibility, generosity, kindness to the person right in front of me? Because that, that's part of it. it they're it. In a universe that totally knows what it's doing, it's not an accident who is in front of you, and it's not an accident who you're thinking about. Because the mind of God, being the mind of infinite love, is always on the move. And it's always on the move in the direction of promoting the actualization, the spiritual self-actualization of all things and all beings. So think of the mind of God like a giant computer. And it's infinitely powerful and infinitely perfect. So this computer is always at work matching people, matching circumstances in such a way that all aspects, which means all people, are given in every moment the maximal growth opportunity, the maximal soul growth opportunity. The universe is literally invested in your enlightenment. To say the universe is invested in your enlightenment is the same thing as saying the universe is invested in your self-actualization. Light means understanding. 
So to say that the universe is invested in your enlightenment means it's invested in your total understanding of who you are. Who you are is an idea in the mind of God. Who you are is an idea in the mind of God. The mind of God is love. Therefore, you are literally a thought of love. And being on this planet is moment by moment by moment an opportunity and often a challenge to remember who we are, to express on earth as it is in heaven. You are the thought of love in the mind of God. What God creates is changeless and unalterable. So that truth about you never changes. The issue in life is not whether or not you are a perfect, loving creation of God. That's set. The issue is whether or not that's what you're going to express in the world. So think of the truth of who you are like a file in a computer, and it is an undeletable file. That's who you are, and that's who everyone is. The issue is that we've been so confused living in this world, and we've been so trained to think that we are who we aren't. And to think that we aren't who we are, that often, instead of being conscious, instead of consciously choosing to express our love, we move into a tightened place, we move into a constricted place, and we move into judgment, we move into attack, and we move into defensiveness. That is because living on this earth, we are taught that we are bodies rather than spirits. We have a problem with self-identification. And The Course in Miracles says that Enlightenment is a shift from body identification to spirit identification. Now, we're talking about the relationship with yourself here, because when you get cool and when you get clear about your relationship to God and your relationship to yourself, which is very, very intimately connected, then and only then are you ready to have relationships with people that are unfractured. Because to the extent to which our relationship with God is fractured, to that extent our relationship with ourself is fractured, to the extent that my relationship with myself is fractured, my relationship with you will be fractured. That's why we're talking about God before we're talking about your husband or your wife or your lover or your friend or your employer or employee. We're talking about base camp. God is base camp. And when we're grounded in that knowledge and that recognition, recognition, and that's the same thing like I was talking about before, about yoga, get into the right position. When we get into the right position in terms of how we see ourselves in relationship to God and how we see ourselves in relationship to ourselves, then we're ready to face the world and our relationships with other people. Now, with what we were just last talking about, stop right now and go right into application. We take everything that is an idea and we want to talk about how we apply it. Your morning is extremely important. If you wake up in the morning and go directly for the newspaper, go directly for the phone, go directly for the computer, you're downloading the thought system based on fear that dominates this world. If instead in the morning, you make sure that you spend even five minutes grounding yourself in the deeper truth. Make your connection with God. Make your connection with your true self, yourself with a capital S. Then you are ready to face the day. So this is the idea. God is love. And not only is God love, but love is all there is. What is all-encompassing can have no opposite. So when you are thinking with love, you are literally being yourself. When you are in any way forgetting who you are, because the thinking of the world has taught you you're in danger when you're not, has taught you you're separate when you're not, has taught you that you have some other function other than to love, even though you don't, you get confused, you get thrown out of the kingdom. That's really, you know, when we say in the the Lord's Prayer, thine is the power and thine is the kingdom and thine is the glory. Love is the power. Love is the kingdom and love is the glory. But boy, living on this earth, we think, oh, no, 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 no. This isn't about love. This isn't about forgiveness. This is about something else. That's the temptation of the false world. And it'll knock you out of your center. It'll knock you out of your wisdom. And you're going to blow it in relationships every single time. Only love is real. What is all-encompassing can have no opposite. So that means that when we're thinking without love, we're actually not thinking, we're hallucinating. 
And that's what the ego is. The ego is a false belief about who we are and a false belief about who other people are. When you realize who you really are, you also realize who other people are. All you are is love inside the mind of God. And that's all who other people are as well. So you've heard the line, there is only one begotten Son. From an esoteric metaphysical perspective, to say there is only one begotten Son means we're all it. So the Course in Miracles says you're like waves in the ocean thinking you're separate from other waves. You're like sunbeams to the sun thinking you're separate from other sunbeams. But really, there is no place where one wave stops and another starts. There really is no place where one sunbeam stops and another starts. But think about the psychological and emotional difference produced by those two differing ways of looking at the world. If I think of myself as one wave and there's an ocean and I'm surrounded by all these other waves from which I am disconnected, how can I not feel terrified of those other waves? How can I not be afraid that in any given moment my being will be obliterated, my being will be annihilated because of the power of the ocean that's going to come over me? But if, on the other hand, I think I'm connected with every other wave, this is one of us here, I'm connected with every other wave, I'm part of the ocean, then I feel at home in this universe. This is extremely important. When I think of myself as one with everyone, I can feel at home here. When I think of myself as separate from other people, I cannot feel at home. And then I really am tempted to mess up relationships because I'm trying to get other people to either like me or other people to act a certain way so I can feel at home. But my even wanting them to do that is based on the idea that I don't realize I am home. That's where those five minutes come in. In The Course in Miracles, which uses Christ-centered language, although it's not the Christian religion, the idea of God, Christ, Holy Spirit is this. God is love. Christ is a word that describes the essence of who we are, which is love. Millions of years ago in time as we know it, although in reality it never happened at all because only love is real, so any loveless thought was actually hallucination, humanity, I don't know, was it one person? I don't know how that works, doesn't explain, had a thought that was separate from love. Why? Because we can. Because free will means you can think whatever you want to think. You can think with love, but you don't have to think with love. And so in that moment that I thought a thought that was separate from love, thought is so powerful that that literally created the world. You know, it really matches up with the whole Big Bang Theory. The moment we had a thought that we were separate from God, in that moment, the Course in Miracles says, materialization was made. And all of a sudden, I have a body that makes it appear as though I'm separate from you. But the truth of the matter is I can't be separate from you because what God created is changeless and unalterable. Now in that moment, you had it's as though this psychic split occurred between two universes. One's ultimately real, one's a hallucination, but they both feel real. The world of the hallucination or the illusion feels very real while we're in it. In fact, feels even more real because it's the world of the body and it is fortified, that illusion is fortified by our bodily senses. That's where suffering begins, when we are disconnected from the truth of who we are. Because if I'm disconnected from the truth of who I am, I'm definitely, inevitably be going, going to be disconnected from the truth of who you are. Now, what happened in that moment millions of years ago in time as we know it, although in reality it never happened at all? What happened in that moment when the Son of God separated itself? It's, a, it's referred to in the moment as, in the Course in Miracles as the separation, and one of the ways it's described is the moment when the Son of God forgot to laugh. We took what the Course calls a detour into fear. So what was God, or total love, going to do in that instant? Well, what would love do? Would love force us back to loving thought? No, because love doesn't force. But The Course in Miracles says that in that moment, God created within our consciousness a link. It is an eternal link, says the, the link between God and his separated sons. So what does that mean? That means that there is within my mind, if at any moment 
I separate myself from love. And then because all thought creates form on some level, remember every cause has an effect. So I have a loveless thought, guess what's gonna happen? Marianne's gonna have a loveless experience. The path of spirituality and enlightenment is to say, I'm not at peace. I must be crazy right now. I must be having an illusion right now. I must be having a hallucination right now. But I am willing to see this differently. I am judging my brother. I'm attacking my brother. I'm defending. I got some stuff going on about another person that is not loving. As a consequence, I'm behaving in a way that is not loving. So I thought that they were doing something that I was judging, and I thought they're deserving of my attack or they're deserving of my defense, whatever it is. Now I feel awful. I'm in anxious in anxiety. I'm in tension. I'm in depression. I'm in anger. I'm in whatever. I am willing to see this differently. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit, which is the connecting link, the eternal connection between you and God, is not going to force you back to love. That would be a violation of your free will. But if we ask for it, we can be taken back. I'll give you an example. It was many, many years ago. And I know how many years ago it was because at the time I was having porcelain fingernails put on, which I think means the 1980s. And I was having this done at the home of a woman who went to my lectures on A Course in Miracles. There was a woman in the room who was her friend and the friend of another couple people who were there. I didn't know these people. They were friends of hers. And they were talking. And one of the women had a way of talking that made me wildly judgmental. There was a grandiosity to it. There was an oddness to it. And it just felt to me like fingernails on a blackboard. And I was just wildly judgmental about this woman. Now, I'm not saying anything. But the irony isn't lost on me that this woman who is holding my hands at the moment, working on my fingernails, thinks of me as this Course in Miracles teacher. She's thinking, I would assume, that I try to practice what I preach. Well, in that moment, I'm in wild judgment. So I'm trying to practice what I preach, and I say, within myself, what the Course in Miracles says we are always supposed to say, and that is, I am willing to see this differently. Because the Course in Miracles says, if you're not at peace, you chose a non-loving thought, and you can choose again. So I said a little prayer, and I said, I'm willing to see this differently. Definitely within five minutes, the conversation among these other people began to change. And this woman, who was speaking in such odd speech patterns and in a way that felt so grandiose to me, I heard one of the other women say to her, hey, I heard they, they let your father out of jail? And I'm listening to them. Now remember, I'm just listening. I've, I'm over here with my fingernails and I don't know these people, I'm just listening. And what I hear is the story. And the story was like one of the worst type of things you might have seen on television, on a crime show or Oprah or something about terrible things that have happened. And this was one of the terrible ones, where this woman, and I think it was her little brother, were kept basically in a dungeon for many years, like in the basement of their house or something, by their father, no contact with anyone. And she literally, when they were rescued after years, did not know how to talk. Now she's out and she's trying to learn to talk and how people are supposed to talk. Now, as soon as I hear that story, I'm listening to her and everything about the way she talks that five minutes before had made me just like, who is she? Why does she talk like that? My heart is now flooded with admiration, compassion, her bravery, the way she's obviously trying to do it right. I thought, and that was the miracle. The miracle wasn't that she changed. The miracle was that I changed. I based all this judgment in my head based on what my ego senses, my ears, what I saw in her face, what I heard with my ears, 
and I made all these judgments. So the Course in Miracles says projection creates perception and not the other way around. I perceived what I decided beforehand to see. As soon as I said I'm willing to see it differently. Now this is another amazing thing about that giant computer that we were talking about a couple minutes ago. From A Course in Miracles perspective, the moment I said that, the moment I said, I am willing to see this differently, it was like the universe went and made sure that that story was then revealed to me because that is what I needed to hear to help me change my mind. And that's how life works. That's how relationships work. We, are, we see what we choose to see. So we go out into the world and we say, well, I wonder how people are going to be today. Power in relationships comes from spending at least five minutes every morning putting your love before you. Before you go into a meeting, before you go on to a date, before you see your <clears throat> lover, friend, spouse, employer, employee, wherever you're going, blast the room with love before you get there. And that instructs the mind. You know, I was reading an article one day about how the physical eye works. There are so many places where my eye could land. And that's how every situation is. There are so many things we could focus on. And sometimes people get it right and sometimes people get it wrong. But the attitudinal musculature that gives you miraculous relationships is where you instruct your subconscious mind before you even go into a room. I want to focus on the love. I want to focus on what people do right. I want to focus on what people can do that I can appreciate them for. I want to focus on what my job is. My job isn't to sit back and figure out how other people behave and whether they do it right. My job is to go into the space wherever it is, declaring with my own internal being that this encounter shall be a holy encounter because that's always possible. And the ego will always be trying to lure me away from that. What, who are you and why are you here? And are you doing it right? And do you matter? No, 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 no. Power, spiritual power in relationships is that you honor. Remember, there's only one of us here. So all of the perfection that's in you is within them. There's nobody better or worse than anyone else. The Course in Miracles says, <clears throat> all of the children of God are special and none of the children of God are special. The issue in relationships is for every encounter to be a holy encounter. What it means for any encounter to be a holy encounter means a kind of namaste consciousness that we develop, that we take with us into a situation. We don't sit back and audition people and wait to see how they perform. We go into a situation requesting that we be an instrument of love. And that's why you want to spend that five minutes in the morning, whether it's the workbook of the Course in Miracles or any other path of meditation and prayerfulness that you have, that you blast like you think in the morning, who do I know that I'm going to see today? And you send them your love. Who, who do I not even know I'm going to meet today? Send them your love. You know how when you go into a room and you can just feel the bad energy? People subconsciously know everything. You want to walk into a room and have people feel the good energy because they know on some subconscious level they've been blessed by you. On some subconscious level, they feel loved by you. It, it, it may or may not have anything to do with what you actually say, but even if it has to do with what you say, it will have to do with the consciousness with which you say it. Everything you do is infused with the consciousness with which you do it. So. The Course in Miracles says everyone we meet will be our crucifier or our savior, depending on what we choose to be to them. So th because there's only one of us here, the Course in Miracles says when you're about to attack a person, think of yourself as holding a sword over their head. And that sword's going to drop on them. Because actually, however, since there's only one of us here, it's not going to fall on their head. It's going to fall on yours. So if I judge you, I will feel judged. If I attack you, I will feel attacked. On the other hand, if I bless you and there's genuine love coming from me towards you, then I will feel more loving. That's why The Course in Miracles says we become generous out of self-interest. Listen, none of us are expressing ourselves perfectly all the time, but we want to be people whose energy is a space where people feel invited to be their best. The Course in Miracles says people hear you on the level that you speak from. So if we have practiced, it's all about practice. It's all about a very practical way of being that not only 
Did you spend five minutes in the morning? Because the Course in Miracles says five minutes spent with the Holy Spirit in the morning is enough to guarantee he will be in charge of your thought forms throughout the day. Because if you just walk out into the day, especially if you've read the newspaper, turned it on TV, the radio, phone, whatever, you will have downloaded the consciousness of fear that dominates the world. And you will have left your mind open. Now, you don't go out into the day without taking a shower or a bath or brushing your teeth because you want yesterday's impurities off your body. So we want to get yesterday's impurities, the stress and all the craziness out of our minds. And then you face the world. And then you bless everybody that you're going to see that day, but you, you keep it up constantly. That before you even walk into a room, before you walk into a meeting, this has nothing to do with what you say verbally. This is the, the work of the miracle worker is all in here. That's where your, your greatest power lies. Your greatest power does not lie, particularly in relationships, in any of your external tools. It lies in the power of your mind. That is what a miracle is. It is a shift from fear to love. And the only way you can have miraculous relationships is if you think miraculously. We all have situations where we fall off the spiritual wagon, where something happened, it wasn't cool, and any given moment, no, I can choose again. A Course in Miracles says you are not asked to have no impure thoughts. You're only asked to have no impure thoughts that you would keep. We all go into craziness. We all go into judgment. We all go into neediness. We all go into criticism. We all go into control. We all go into anger. We all go into attack. We all go into judgment. We all go into defense. We're human. But we heal through, we, we heal spiritually just like we heal in a physical detox. The stuff has got to come out in order to be released. So you say, wow, that was just a real judgmental thought I had, or that was a really angry moment I just had. And you surrender it to the Holy Spirit. You ask it to be taken from you. That's what it means to atone for your error. And the universe is going to come around again in some amazing way and give you the opportunity to even be better now. We're talking about these universal principles. Universal in the sense that they are to be applied to every relationship. Because when these form the basis of our relationship problem-solving repertoire, as The Course in Miracles says, then we are so much further ahead. Then when we talk about romance, or we talk about work, or we talk about any specific area of relationship, we've got so much power going on because we have the basic foundation of what it means to, in our own minds, be at one with God, which is the key to being at one with other people. Okay, so this is where it starts to get gnarly. It starts to get gnarly because this stuff is a lot easier said than done. Why is that? It's easy enough to say, okay, here's the universe of love, here's the universe of fear. The universe of love is real, the universe of fear is unreal. The world that's fearful, though, feels more real because it's the, the illusion we live under. But all we have to do is go from the world of fear to the world of love, and then that's a miracle, and voila. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's real life as we live it. This is the deal. Your mental power is so great that whatever choice you make, it literally has huge force behind it. So the ego mind, The Course in Miracles, is not just the choice to perceive without love. It is the vigilant temptation and lure and proactive messing with your mind that would lead you to perceive without love. The Course in Miracles says that the ego is like a scavenger dog, and it is always looking for any scratch of evidence of your brother's guilt. Remember earlier I talked about how in any given situation, there's so many places where my eyes could light. Well, in any situation, there are so many ways that you could judge a brother. So many ways you could say, Mm, that's just not quite good enough, or that's not really what I asked for, or whatever. And the vision of one world, the Course of Miracles says, costs you the vision of the other. So if I'm concentrating on your guilt, I can't see your innocence. But if I'm concentrating on your innocence, your, your error won't be that big a deal to me. So in every moment, not only are we making a choice, but it's like we're being pushed from behind. Choose this or choose that. The Holy Spirit is always offering you the opportunity, not forcing you though, because love doesn't force. So remember, the ego is that scavenger dog looking for any, any shred of evidence of your brother's guilt. It is your own mind 
turned against you. It is your own self-hatred masquerading as self-love. The ego mind is your voice, just like the Holy Spirit is your voice. So the ego mind, I know when I think of the biggest mistakes I've made in my life in relationships, and The Course in Miracles says everything is a relationship. I didn't wake up that morning and go, I'm going to be a jerk today. <laughs> That's my intention to be a jerk today. It is my intention to say the one thing that'll make him so pissed off. It is my intention to undermine this circumstance and undermine that relationship and undercut that professional opportunity because of the way I behave or the things that I say. Of course I didn't. But that's the importance of that five minutes, because if you didn't fill your house with, with love, it, you know, the fear is going to set in. If you don't proactively dedicate your thinking to the purposes of love, the same mental power will be used for the purposes of your neurosis. And your neurosis is your separation from self, the things you say and the things you do that began with the things you thought that were insane, that were not the truth about who you are and who other people are in relation to you. So if you do not ground yourself in the morning in those correct positions, once again, yoga, if you don't align yourself with that correct position attitudinally, you're going to be off to the races running. And this is particularly important today because, man, we are living in some mean-spirited times. And social media has exacerbated all this. And there's so much that has all of us just attacking people because they didn't say it the way we thought they should say it. They did, you know, these days it's not even that somebody doesn't agree with you. They have to not only agree with you, but say it the way you would have said it. And it's just like everybody's like, like this. We all have to return to love here. Give gen general amnesty, emotional amnesty towards everybody. You know, one of the important issues in relationships is other people really do not owe it to you to see it the way you see it. And other people do not owe it to you to act the way you think that they should act. The, the, the person whose life you're here to monitor is your own. The person whose mind you need to be monitoring is your own. Remember, only what you are not giving can be lacking in any situation. So just the word disciple and the word discipline come from the same root. We, we discipline our minds. We discipline our attitudinal muscle, just like you go to the gym. And it's the, same, it's the same principle. Once you get to a certain age, if you're not working to hold these muscles up, they're headed down. And so you have to do accumulated repetitions of holding up, right? Because otherwise, gravity will pull you down. Well, there's attitudinal gravity. There's spiritual gravity. There's emotional gravity. There's psychological gravity. Gravity pulls you into the anger. Gravity pulls you into the defensiveness. Gravity turns you into the selfishness. Gravity pulls you into the critical thought. Gravity pulls you into all those negative thoughts and feelings, which then sabotage your relationships. So we practice because it goes against. We, we are trained in this world of fear, the Course says, to the point where at a very young age, natural or loving thinking actually feels unnatural to us. And unnatural or non, you know, real thinking actually feels more natural. It act, and that's why sometimes people say, well, I, I was just expressing my real feelings and I was being my authentic self. When I'm experiencing or expressing my anger, and then I say, well, that was just my authentic self. No, it actually wasn't your authentic self. Your authentic self is that undeletable file in the computer, which is your love. But we all get triggered. We all had childhoods. We all have those places where in any given moment, we don't know how to express our love and get our needs met. But that's what working a spiritual path is because we're responsible for those places. You know, these days it's so big. I, I know a woman and she's in a relationship with a guy and everything, everything, everything he does is the excuse. It's something he went through in his childhood. We've got to stop with that. It doesn't really matter where you got it. It's yours now. So I could say, well, I'm needy because of something with my father and my mother. That might be true. But once you're a grown-up, once you're a mature adult, it's like, dear God, take my neediness from me. It's not enough to say, I am needy because this happened when I was five, and now I will analyze it. You can't analyze away the darkness. You only get rid of the darkness by turning on the light. So in order to have good relationships, and we have to realize that our loveless patterns could be your anger, your neediness, your controllingness, your whining. Whatever it is you do, we all have the stuff we do. It's not about what form our obstruction and the walls before our hearts take. The issue is 
to identify them and realize that that's all they are. There's a quote from The Course in Miracles that I know you've probably seen on the internet attributed to Rumi, but it's not a Rumi quote. It's a Course in Miracles quote. And that is, your job is not to seek for love. Your, see your job is to seek all the barriers you hold against its coming. You are already perfect love. The issue is that we've built up these walls in front of it, and the walls take the form of these character defects or these mental and emotional habit patterns that lead to behavior that keep love at bay, which is just another way of saying make people don't like you, make people not want to be with you, not want to hire you, not want to work for you, not want to marry you, not want to love you, not want to be your friend. I mean, it's like a big deal. That's all that relationships are about. And we're responsible for paving the way of easy access to the flow. Easy. So we have to declutter it because God created us in such a way that you are me and I am you. I don't have to create intimacy. I just have to put my mind in the place where what could be more intimate than that we are each other. So when I'm in my natural state, not only do I naturally feel my love for you, but you know what? It feels good to you too. Time and space are part of the illusion. They're part of the three-dimensional miasma. Buddha called it an illusion. The Course in Miracles calls it an illusion. Einstein said that time and space are part of the illusion, albeit a persistent one. So once again, we're in this world, but the truth, the ultimate truth of who we are lies beyond this world. This world is like a veil in front of the world we want. One of the exercises in the Course is, beyond this world, there is a world I want. And that does go back to what is actually a quote from Rumi, where he says, beyond all ideas of good and bad and right and wrong, there is a field. I'll meet you there. So the veil, the walls that keep us separate from each other are the thoughts of judgment. You're wrong. You're right. Good. Bad. So on the other side of that is the truth where we are one. And actually, there is no time or space, so it's not like you're even over there. With my body's eyes, you appear to be over there and I'm over here. But in ultimate reality, there is no space any more than there's time. So... The idea is that, kind of like if you imagine the spokes of a wheel, and usually when we identify each other, we think, where is your position on the rim of the wheel? But actually, if you take each spoke to its central starting point, there's only one point from which every spoke emanates. You know, the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung said, if you go deep enough into your mind and deep enough into my mind, there are mental images or archetypes that we all share. But the idea of the Christ mind is one step lower, go deeper, which is if you go deep enough into your mind and deep enough into my mind, we're the same mind. That's the meaning of there's only one begotten son. So how much more intimate could we be than that we are each other? You don't have to create intimacy. You have to recognize, recognize the world in which we are one. Once again, not your job to seek for love, but to seek all the barriers you hold against its coming. And those barriers are in the form of our own judgments, our own thoughts. That's where the problem is, and that's where the solution lies.